my son deserved to die with dignity, with his family and his friends beside him. Dad, he says, uh, I've run out of time. I, I, you'll get up one morning, I'll be gone. happy little child and a bundle of energy. Every Friday night we would take him to Boston Pizza and he wanted to run around and talk to people. You know Adam, he's a very social guy. And so he'd go up to the booth like this and just plunk himself down and say, hello, I'm Adam. He got into soccer and uh, he started having particular problems there with uh, urges to do things that was distracting for him from his game. A need to flick his hands like that, his fingers, and what he would do, he would tape them up for the game so he couldn't do that. He was a very buff dude. You would have no idea there was like anything wrong with him at all. There's often times not a physical representation of it. So when you tell somebody like, oh, I've got a lot of anxiety today, I can't right now, or like, you gotta leave me alone right now, I feel like a lot of people are just like, ugh, can you just get over it? The brain is creating pain for no reason because it's occurring within the brain it's therefore a mental disorder it's not your typical mental disorder like bipolar disorder or psychosis schizophrenia etc it's just this this manifestation of physical pain that is being caused by my brain if I'm sitting here silently although I would be mind-numbingly bored my pain would probably be at a lower level, if not one of the lowest levels that I'm going to experience throughout that day. If I had pulled out this book and started reading, within, I would say five minutes, the pain in my head would be so aggressive, I would A, have to stop reading, and B, have to go and do deep breaths somewhere. It's like my, my whole body is being burned from the inside by acid. He says it's behind my eyes, it's in my forehead, it's through my head, my neck, my chest, okay, all down my back. And it's, it's agonizing pain, it's like I'm being burned alive. Adam didn't believe that he was going to get better and he could give you, and you can look on his Facebook wall, the list of treatments and medications that he's tried over the years, tried and they failed him. He knew that, that there was no cure, that, uh, that modern science, modern medicine isn't there yet. And so, you know, when you're somebody who's highly intellectual and great ambitions and you've experienced uh, modicums of, of significant cess already, you want to return to that. When you know you're not going to get it, then where do you go? We came to realize that every time we had a conversation with him, it might be our last. A Windsor man is challenging Canada's assisted dying law. It came into effect last summer, but does not extend to people with mental illness. Now, Adam Meyer Clayton insists that has to change. C-14 doesn't include people like me. It doesn't include a lot of very, very sick people. The legislation literally forces people to kill themselves in an undignified manner, alone, without their family beside them. It doesn't make sense. He was working for a change in C-14. He was working for increased awareness of, of what somatoform pain is. He said, Dad, all this activism is not for me. I'll be dead. He says, I'm doing this for others, not me. The issues around mental illness are fairly new, but at the same time, we are fundamentally talking about you know, how can we not discriminate against groups of people who just happen to have certain types of diagnosis? How can we not further stigmatize them or worse, infantilize them by telling them that their illnesses aren't as severe or as real as somebody with physical conditions?
I understand suicide is bad. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying life sucks, you're screwed, yada yada, let's all jump off bridges. Anyone who knows me knows I advocate treatment. I'm still going even though I'm incredibly screwed up. I'm like quivering from the pain, man. Jeez, Louise. No one wants to lose a friend, absolutely. But just seeing that the pain that he was in, to be like, don't do this, it would be selfish on my part. And it wouldn't be right for me to be like, no, you have to stay because I can't handle you leaving. Thanks. Like, that's just the ultimate form of selfishness. Dad, would you want to live the way you've seen me living over the past year or so? No, I wouldn't. So if you were in my shoes, can you honestly say, do you think if you were in my shoes, you would be pursuing the right to die or, or, or at the very minimum think, hey, I, this is something I deserve? Yes. Okay, so so we're in agreement that if the roles were reversed here and I was holding the camera and you were sick, that you would not want to live if, that were, if this were your destiny? Correct. Okay, so we have that clear. And, and this is my father speaking. Nothing's working, nothing's working, I know I can't die, I'm thinking of suicide, etc, 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 and then, you know, that's how the story goes, people kill themselves. It's been going on for decades and decades and decades. Think about the situation, if they can't get better and their life is hell, why would they not commit suicide? Can you give me one good reason? My son had to slink away in the middle of the night, after midnight, after his dad had gone to sleep, getting into his car, driving down the expressway to meet his fate. My son dies all alone in a motel room without anyone there. No friends, no family, nobody. Graham and I could not be there. We would have been potentially criminally prosecuted for aiding and abetting. I don't think he had any other choice. Um, it was his own decision. Nobody wanted him to die. He didn't want to die, but he couldn't go on the way he was suffering. When uh, Ed and Maya Creighton committed suicide, um, I was I I personally was concerned about how commentators, uh, advocates jumped on the occasion of this tragedy to attack the legislation. There are several interwoven characteristics of mental illness that make it, uh, I think, very problematic. First of all, at the outset, we do not know who are the people who will recover and who are the people who will not recover. And it would also be a tragedy to introduce a system on the basis of these very exceptional cases because it would lead to tragedies that we don't hear about. Because people who are dead don't talk. Uh, so they won't talk about the fact that they were maybe prematurely killed. We need to be careful not to provide an out to tough situations. Physicians are human and they can feel like they're failing when suffering persists, despite everything tried. I don't think we get the balance right by saying, you want your suffering to end, therefore we're going to terminate your life. I don't want to say that we shouldn't do everything possible to reduce personal suffering, but we, we can't expect of medicine that it's, we're, we're, we're going to eradicate suffering from life. And somehow that has emerged as the social and medical and political project. Adam loved life. He wanted to stick around. But the pain, it became too unbearable, even for my very strong son. <laughs> 